I'd like to call the meeting back to order. We just got uh, an email from uh, our former executive director who's trying to listen, saying I'm hard to hear, which is amazing to me. <laughs> so I will try to speak uh, uh, directly into the microphone and with greater clarity and volume. Um, at any rate, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Josh uh, Sharfstein and Dr. Andrea Geelan here from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. And so I invite you now to uh, take the podium and address the crowd. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Adler. Um, uh, my name is Josh Sharfstein. I'm a professor of the practice Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I'll be talking for a little bit, then Professor Geelan will come up and, and talk for a little bit, and then I'll talk a little bit more, and then we're done. So that's, that's the plan. Um, and thanks. Well, so we're so delighted that you made a trip, and we know you've got serious time constraints, so we look forward to hearing from you. No, no problem. My only regret is that I don't have time to stop at Pines of Rome, <laughs> if you know that restaurant. I it do. Would, I love if it. I it said, it's about to close, too. Don't say that. If I said that I went on 90% of my dates to the Pines of Rome in high school, that would be an underestimate by approximately 10%. <laughs> so, all right, uh, crib bumpers, um, we're going to talk about um, Maryland's experience and, and some other uh, data that Professor Gillen is going to share. Um, let me just say that um, I previously served as the Secretary of Maryland's Health Department um, and the Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City, and Professor Gillen is really considered uh, one of the top, if not the top, prevention experts in the field of public health. She has won pretty much every award there is to win in that field. She's, she's not going to say that, so I will say that. And um, including uh, having served as president of the Society for the Advancement of Injury and Violence Research and the Award for Excellence from the American Public Health Association. And I could spend my whole time reading off her awards. So um, I'm going to, uh, we'll talk about Marilyn's experience, uh, then uh, Professor Gillen's going to speak, and we'll talk a, a few comments on the um, CPSC staff response. So in Maryland, there's a, a, a law that authorizes the Secretary of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to regulate hazardous substances. Um, and it uh, says that the Secretary can declare as a hazardous material um, anything that the a material that the Secretary finds is intended for use by children that presents a electrical, mechanical, or thermal hazard, and if um, labeling cannot protect the public health and safety adequately, the secretary has the authority to adopt rules and regulations to ban the, the sale of the hazardous material. And so um, our process on uh, crib bumpers started in April 2011 when we uh, published a request for comment about the use of crib bumpers and uh, that we provided a little bit of data, some links to some scientific publications, and we got uh, public comment um, from, from a variety of people. In May 2011, we presented the com comments and all the papers that we could find to an advisory panel that had four senior pediatricians um, in the city and one public health officer. And as a result of that meeting, uh, four of them uh, all of them agreed that <coughs> bumpers should not be used, and four of them suggested that the state consider a ban. Um, we subsequently heard from the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association, which had submitted comments, um, but they wanted the opportunity to meet with the advisory committee directly, and we gave them that opportunity in July 2011. There was a meeting just for them and the experts that they wanted to bring, and um, the, the, there was an extensive discussion. The panel was joined by an assistant medical examiner in the state of Maryland. And at the end of that, the advisory panel agreed that there was no meaningful evidence of benefit and uh, uh, persisted with its overall recommendation that the state consider a ban. Um, in October 2011, the department published a second request for public comment, this time on a proposal to ban the sale of baby bumper pads. So this was not actually a formal regulatory proposal. It was a this is what we're thinking, but we want public comment before we consider proceeding. We got more than 30 comments uh, back um, in October 2011. In July 2012, we actually proposed a regulation ba and in which we, we um, referred to the comments. We made changes to the original proposal, um, and the regulation uh, was proposed to ban the sale of non mesh crib bumpers in the state of Maryland with a effective date of June 21st, 2013. Um, in December, a committee of the Maryland General Assembly held a hearing to review the proposed regulations and it declined to ask for a delay, which basically is 
what its authority is in that situation, um, more or less, um, but they declined. Um, and the, uh, in June 2013, a ban on the sale of crib bumpers went into effect in Maryland. So if you go back, we had, uh, it was really from April 2011 to June 2013, um, there were actually multiple um, opportunities for public comment. There were multiple public hearings. This was something that was done through the regulatory process with a very deliberate approach. We modified what we thought was appropriate based on the public comment that we received. Um, I stepped down as the secretary at the end of 2014, so I was secretary through this entire process. Um, and in thinking about this and in deciding whether or not this was um, a risk to public health, we had to evaluate both the potential benefit and the potential risk of baby bumper pads. Um, we found no evidence of meaningful benefit at the ages recommended for infants. We'll circle back to that. In fact, there was explicit discussion um, and it, with the, uh, during that industry panel about is, what is the evidence for a benefit and there really was no compelling evidence presented. At one point, I think they were asked, is there, do, do you even believe that babies at this age could, could, you know, exert enough force with their heads to bang it against the side and, and they said they didn't have any evidence to believe that that was the case. So there was really um, no evidence of meaningful benefit, and there was evidence of potentially lethal risk at the ages recommended for infants. And so um, that was the basis of the um, decision. Um, we also were very, very clear that when we communicated about this, we weren't just talking about baby bumper pads, because I think, uh, crib bumpers, I should say, I think a very important point, which is we're not talking about the vast majority of infant deaths when we're talking about crib bumpers, we're talking about a small number. But if the, if the um, risk exceeds the benefit, then you're putting babies at risk needlessly. But the big number is generally from a lot of the other safe sleep issues. And so we embedded a message about um, baby bumper pads in the overall ABCs of safe sleep. In fact, I was quoted saying, every time, alone, back crib, and D, don't use bumpers. You know, so it was always in that context. And, we really wanted to make sure that this was embedded in an overall sleep message and it didn't stand alone. And I think that by the time we were done with the two-year process, we had a, quite a lot of understanding of this um, and uh, we, that, that we had been deliberate and we had looked at the evidence and we considered the benefits and the risks and we went forward without, you know, um, really any problem in terms of implementation. So um, in terms of follow-up data, I think it's important, you know, to realize because this is dealing with a small number of deaths generally, which you're not going to see major shifts in um, population-based data. Um, but I do think that uh, the best place to look is in Baltimore City, in part because they have the most unexplained deaths in infancy in the state in Baltimore. They have a public health focus on sleep-related deaths. They have closed tracking of sleep-related deaths. And according to the City Health Department, uh, 2015 was the lowest number of sleep-related deaths uh, on record, and 2016 looks even better so far, they've said. Um, 2015 was also the lowest infant mortality rate on record and the lowest African-American infant mortality rate on record in Baltimore City. And um, we reached out, uh, this is just one of the headlines from earlier this month. Um, the, uh, this is a letter that um, Rebecca Deneen, who has really been the architect of the city's infant mortality uh, uh, strategy, submitted, uh, just sent to me just because I told her I was coming today. So we have a copy for you for the record. And basically what she said was uh, banning baby bumper pad sales in Maryland was critical to the Safe Sleep campaign. It reinforces and promotes the messages that babies must sleep, sleep alone. Um, Baby bumper pads have been associated with suffocation and asphyxiation in young infants, and in older infants, they're hazardous because infants can use them to climb out of the crib and fall. The Safe Sleep campaign has been used across Maryland and nationally to prevent infant deaths. It's won, you know, different awards and is cited in many places. I'll, that's my editorial comment, but banning crib uh, bumpers is critical, this is her again, to consistent messaging about how infants can sleep safely and reduces just one more risk factor that could result in an infant death. So you have that letter for the record. Um, I'm now going to turn over to Professor Geelan to, to speak a little bit more generally uh, from an injury prevention perspective. Thank you, Josh. It's um, an honor to be here and have this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Commissioner Adler, and thank you, Josh. Um, 
I'm here today as uh, Josh is. We're here on our own behalf um, as injured as public health people, um, and not on behalf of the university. Um, but I'm here particularly because um, when Maryland decided to um, institute the ban, um, I was one of the people who wrote a letter of support. Um, after reviewing the evidence and concurring with their findings that small but real and unreasonable risk of serious injury significantly outweighs the unproven and lesser benefits of bumper pad use. Um, I am here today to restate that opinion in response to the recent staff brief briefing package on bumpers. So in addition to that, I wanted to just make three points um, after having reviewed the staff um, briefing document, I'd like to share sort of three injury prevention approaches or ideas that I think are relevant to your um, decision making today. And then very briefly share some preliminary data from a um, safe sleep program that we're doing in Baltimore. Um, so first on the slide here you see is the precautionary principle. It states that the potential threat of harm, even in the absence of definitive cause and effect relationships, should be sufficient for action. And this precautionary principle has its roots in environmental risks, but many of us find it useful for policy decision making and injury prevention. In fact, a world renowned pediatrician, Dr. Barry Pless, who is the professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and biostatistics at McGill University, as well as director of the injury prevention program at Montreal Children's Hospital and former president of the American Pediatric Associ Ambulatory Pediatric Association, excuse me, um, stated that indeed this principle should be the bedrock of most injury prevention efforts. This principle is really relevant to the case of crib bumpers because there are no countervailing benefits of their use. The second injury prevention... Uh, may I interrupt for just one second just sure. to uh, put a brief comment on the record. Um, I am somebody who likes the precautionary principle, but I've always been reminded that that is not the law that governs CPSC action, uh, that in point of fact, we do have to show uh, cause and effect, at least to the extent of showing that a, a risk is associated with uh, harm to consumers. So. Uh, just to be absolutely clear, I think this is a, a very important principle. Someday maybe you can convince our legislature to incorporate that into the Consumer Product Safety Act, uh, but at the risk of being a Grinch on the point, that is not the principle that governs our action. I should also point out that I don't hear anybody here saying that we should make our decision based exclusively on the precautionary principle. If anything, what I'm hearing is there's some excuse me, significant and substantial data that does support a cause and effect relationship. Thank you. It was, um, in some of the work that we've been doing, it was a new, um, a new idea to me and certainly something that um, is very relevant to um, when we think about injury prevention. And I certainly take your point about what's possible and what's not possible. Um, so the second point um, is that the first and best injury countermeasure, and I think you've already made this point, um, Commissioner Adler, is that is the idea of eliminating the hazard when possible through engineering solutions. And that's why we no longer have drawstrings on children's clothing, for instance. And I think the same thinking applies here, which would save countless lives of innocent infants. Third, the last choice for an injury countermeasure should be relying on consistent vigilance by human beings to protect themselves because it's difficult and it's often ineffective. Many injury prevention messages are not understood by large proportions of people because they're communicated without consideration of literacy and cultural issues. And many safety recommendations that are understood are simply ignored, forgotten, or intermittently followed because of poor communication strategies and because after all, we're all fallible human beings. When an ethical and feasible feasible alternative exists, as in the case of banning unsafe crib bumpers, we should eschew approaches that put the burden for infant safety on parents. If the Consumer Product Safety Commission were to adopt messages that run counter to what every major child safety organization recommends, the burden on parents would be exponentially greater. 
And finally, I'm just going to share, I don't have a slide on this because literally it's very preliminary, um, as in um, put together <laughs> yesterday we looked at our data. Um, we have a safe sleep study currently underway in Baltimore funded by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development. It's a randomized control trial of an educational program compared to the standard of care provided in the Harriet Lane uh, Primary Care Clinic at Johns Hopkins. And that clinic serves a mostly African-American medical assistance um, population. And our health educator intervention group is compared, as I said, to the um, standard of care for well child care. And to date, we've conducted follow-up home visits to actually observe sleep environments with 118 moms when their babies are about two months old. Um, concern was raised in the briefing documents that if crib bumpers were banned, parents would put more soft objects in the crib. Um, of our 118 parents, we had 27 who said their baby had slept in a crib. The majority were sleeping in pack and plays or bassinets. So we were able to observe the 27 cribs, of which three had bumper pads in them, and 100% of those, or all three of them, had other soft objects in them, uh, blankets, toys, a pillow, or a positioner. Um, among the 24 cribs that did not have bumper pads in them, 50% had other soft objects. So um, none of the cribs in our um, intervention group had soft objects or bumper pads in them. So the message was getting to our, um, to our moms about that risk. And all the cribs that we observed met the standard for the safe distance between the cribs. So while our data do not directly address whether the soft objects that we observed were substitutes for bumper pads and our numbers are small, luckily our bumper pad numbers were really small, probably in part due to the ban, um, the data do suggest that banning bumper pads and educating families may be an effective strategy to protect newborns. We will be following up these families again when their babies are four months old and we'll have more data to report on at a later date. So in summary, I believe that when it comes to crib bumpers, the evidence is still on the side of real and unreasonable risk to infants, and we've seen no evidence that the ban in Maryland has resulted in higher rates of other unsafe sleep practices. In fact, the ban may have contributed to the reductions in sleep-related deaths in Baltimore as a result of it taking a comprehensive approach in Baltimore City where we combine the ban with education and access to safe sleep products like pack and plays. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share this um, information, and I turn it back over to Josh for his um, conclusions, or our conclusions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we just wanted to make a few comments on the um, staff document. The um, first is that uh, the concept of sort of if there are more than one hazard in the crib, then that's not really a a kind of a case to be focused on, um, we did not think had merit. Um, it failed to recognize that many injury deaths have multiple causes, and it's important to think about um, the fact that you can have more than one cause. That doesn't mean that, that it wasn't, uh, in fact, contributing. And uh, when we talked about this in front of the advisory panel, that this was explicitly uh, considered to be an inadequate way of thinking, particularly the assistant medical examiner was quite um, uh, focused on the fact that when she's attributing deaths, she attributes deaths to more than one thing. That's the practice of doing it. You don't just say, well, since there was more than one thing, it couldn't be anything. Um, and even if you use that method, you still find some cases where the products have caused serious injury. So I think we we're both pointing out that it's not a persuasive method. Even if you do use that method, it's still showing unreasonable risk. Second thing is I, we did not find the attribution of benefit to crib bumpers in that document credible. And um, at the age of recommended use, um, there's essentially no risk of serious injury from a crib that meets CPSC standards. This was discussed um, in the SAFS analysis. They talked a little bit about limb entrapment, but didn't even talk about the age where that would happen. When we talked about this at the uh, advisory committee, there really was nothing to speak on behalf of injury at the recommended age. And um, is it um, possible that older kids who are really, you know, moving around the, the crib could get their limbs entrapped? It 
could, those kids are at extremely high risk of vaulting themselves out of the crib. In fact, most parents who, I don't want to say most, but many parents that I've talked to about crib bumpers, what they tell me is that they took them out after their child hit their head the first time because they took a step and fell out of the crib, which is a, you know, a not insignificant risk. Um, but uh, for older kids, um, you know, all kinds of things can happen to them. But at the age you're really talking about, it's not a significant issue. And you, it doesn't make sense to write that there's a benefit without examining the age issue, which is a fundamental failure of the staff document. Um, we multiple times asked our advisory panel whether they found any meaningful benefit and unanimously failed to find meaningful benefit. The last point is uh, on this idea that um, parents would respond to abandoned sales by taking more dangerous action. And this is a, a concern that I'd heard. Uh, I was involved as a city health commissioner in petitioning the FDA to uh, remove from the market over-the-counter cough and cold medicines, which at the time were used by many, many, many parents. And we had an advisory committee meeting at the FDA, and the position of the manufacturers was, um, you know, it, it was a, a generally similar story, by the way. There was no evidence of meaningful benefit, and there were definitely cases of kids who had gotten into serious trouble and even died from over-the-counter cough and cold medicine. And the uh, companies at the time argued that, well, if you take away these, you know, parents may harm their children in some other way. And their big concern was that they would, if you didn't have the dropper, they would give a teaspoon of the adult and you get more overdoses. You know, and our view was that parents want to do what's best for their kids. They will listen to the rationale. You put it in the right context and you communicate clearly. Parents are not going to rush out after they hear that something is unsafe and, and in mass give more of it to their children. It is not a logical thing to do, but we didn't know at the time. And in the end, what happened was that the companies voluntarily withdrew all those products for kids up to age four. And since that time, there has been research on this question. There have been multiple studies. And those studies have not found that compensation that was you know, worried about at those hearings. There have been multiple studies showing substantial declines in poison control calls and emergency department visits. Um, I'm going to include in my slides here the references for three major papers. But it is just unquestionable that that action led to a substantial decline in risk for that population. And I think that the, the concept that there'll be, you know, kids will be even more at risk is, is a, you know, you can make the argument. But I, I think in general, I don't think that is where evidence is how parents react to, to actions like this. So um, to conclude, I think that um, where there's no evidence of meaningful benefit, there's no justification for permitting a potentially lethal risk for infants. Um, we think the CPSC should ban the sale of baby bumper pads nationally, just as it's been done in Maryland. The ban should be coordinated with public health agencies, child safety agencies, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, and should emphasize all important messages regarding safe sleep in a consistent and effective manner in order to get the greatest public health benefit from um, this particular policy. So with that, we'll pause, and thank you for having us. And if there are any questions, we're happy to. Um, I do invite uh, m members sitting at the table to ask questions or make comments. I do have uh, a couple of uh, quick comments. I was proud to see that the uh, law that you uh, operate under in Maryland is patterned after the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, which is a piece of legislation that we enforce. And I was reading that, and it looked like uh, it it matched language that was, I think, in the 1966 Child Health and Protect Protection Act. I'm digging deep into my memory bank to get that. But it is so nice to see that we have a common approach. The one observation uh, that you made that really does resonate with me is that merely because other things are contributing to the fatalities, the fact that crib bumpers are also contributing to fatalities is, is the important point. So I just want to make certain I uh, emphasize this point and see it, uh, how you uh, respond to it. It is not the case that you are asserting that there may be a hazard associated with crib bumpers. I think if I understand you correctly, you're saying there is a hazard associated with crib bumpers, sometimes by themselves and sometimes in conjunction with bedding in uh, cribs. But there's no question in your mind, but there is a direct causal link between the presence of crib bumpers and children's fatalities. Just to yeah, let me answer, and then I would like Professor Gillen to answer. I think that the 
evidence from um, the actual death scene investigations, kids who are strangled, kids who are smothered against the crib bumper, you know, though that is evidence that these products are not safe in the crib. Um, I think that where you have the child smushed against the bumper and there's a blanket over their head, you know, I don't think you can say that the bumper has no causal role in that, you know. And so if there's more than one problem, you don't just throw that case out. And I guess I would ask Professor Gielen to comment on that and just in general how attribution is handled in the field. Um, well, um, I was looking mostly at the prevention side of the equation, and I think the people who presented earlier probably have more comment on the actual death scene investigations um, to share on that particular point. So, um, you know, I, I don't really think I can okay. contribute. Well, uh, the other observation I would make is that uh, we, we've, years ago when we were first implementing uh, leg regulation that was mandated under the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008, and the complaint was that the amount of lead in the kinds of products that we had jurisdiction over toys and other children's products was really minor and that the major issue with lead was uh, lead left over from the addition of lead to gasoline. But the fact is that, uh, as we were reminded constantly, this is a, a, a holistic issue. It's, it cuts across all sorts of jurisdictions. And so one of the things you try to do is within your area of control to try to control that which you can control. And so I think this is uh, one of those examples where there, there really does seem to be a causal nexus. And I wanted just to put on the record, because I had done some research on this, the kinds of uh, circumstances under which the commission has said we have jurisdiction. Uh, for example, if you have a medicine cabinet that's manufactured without a lock, uh, the medicine cabinet itself does not attack little kids uh, and is not what is injuring kids. It's the failure of a lock to be there. And uh, our general counsel years ago said that we would have jurisdiction in a situation like that. We would also have jurisdiction over fire extinguishers that fail to put out fires. Now, the fire extinguisher hazard in that case is not somebody hitting somebody else on the head with a fire extinguisher or it falling on a consumer. It's just it didn't function when it was supposed to function, and that would be a sufficient causal nexus for us to have jurisdiction. And then uh, my favorite example, a traffic light that doesn't signal properly. Uh, not that we regulate them, but we could uh, in an appropriate case, even though it's not the traffic light that is directly right. causing the injury. And I mean, Dr. If, if Sharfstein, if I, if please. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm reinterpreting the question a little bit now. I, I'm thinking about um, uh, one of the other things that we always go to is trying to make the safest behavior, the easiest behavior. So in the blanket over the baby on the bumper, um, you're, obviously the blankets have many other functions that are useful and helpful and you're not going to ban blankets because um, they have the benefit. And so if anything there is contributing and you, ha you can remove the hazard, um, then you should remove the hazard. We can remove blankets by only educating people about what's their use and how to use it properly. But with, with crib bumpers, there isn't benefit and we can remove the hazard. So we should do that. So if that's the kind of injury prevention perspective you were thinking yeah. of, it finally clicked. I was thinking of all the, you missed all the uh, things we saw earlier. Okay. So I was, I was back in those pictures, which is not a good place to be. Well, I, I think that's helpful. <laughs> I think one of the things that came up in our public comment period and it came up with cough and cold medicines is Obviously, many, many children took cough and cold medicines or used bumper pads and were fine. You know, it's not the case that it's you use it and you have an injury, 100%. We're talking about generally rare risks. But that's the right question is whether they're real risks. And you can absolutely see in a number of different cases that these are real risks to kids. And then you have to say, if you have real risks, a child could die 
Is there evidence of benefit that, over, that, that, that justifies that? And in the case of cough and cold medicine, you know, there, was, there really wasn't any evidence. And that led them to be removed from the market. And the world didn't stop, stop spinning at that. You know, even though many, many, many more parents use that than for longer periods of time than, than bumper pads, you know, people understood the rationale. It was accepted because there was a serious risk without real evidence of benefit. The benefit question really has to be um, appreciated. And I think the failure of the staff document to do a, a, a credible job on benefit is really the weakness of the analysis that's there. I also did want to ask Dr. Galen, uh, the study that's currently underway, when those results are more uh, concrete, I would appreciate it if you would share those with the Commission. Absolutely. And we will be doing a better job of observing the soft objects um, from here on out um, so that we can actually address what they are and whether they are things that parents are using because they think they need them to replace the bumpers right. that I mean, they can't have. We have, don't have that, but we will going forward. And I think the letter from Rebecca Deneen is very clear on this. It's a much clearer public health message, if you can talk about nothing. It's, it's very hard to say, don't put anything puffy in the crib, but it's okay to put a humongous puffy thing all around the edge of the crib. It's not a consistent message at all. And I think her view is that it's very reinforcing with the safe sleep messages that, that they've used to dramatically reduce uh, infant death in the city. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments, Dr. Moon? Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that when you have, um, if you do risk factor analysis with regards to these um, infant deaths, um, the risk factors are multiplicative. And so the more you have, the, the more rapidly your risk increases. So um, if you, you know, so for instance, if you take out smoking out of the equation, then your, your risk drops. It doesn't drop to zero, but it, it does drop significantly. And, and so when you take out, so, we, so when we look at the whole sleep environment, we do, you know, if you take out this, if you take out that, all of these things are going to make a difference. Um, and, um, and, and for some of the children, it will be a tipping point. Um, and I think that bumper uh, pads for many children are the tipping point. Ms. Covington. I would just concur with that. When we were looking at our narratives and people were saying, well, what are you going to do next? Ba ban pillows, ban adult pillows. And, you know, because the, a lot of the babies that we looked at, the, the cases I showed you rolled off of pillows that were put in the bed. But the fact of the matter is they rolled off the pillow into the, into the crib bumper, and the crib bumper didn't have a purpose. I mean, well, it probably has a purpose, but I, I sort of agree with you that the benefit isn't there in terms of what its purpose is. So if they'd rolled off the adult pillow, would they have been all right? If they only had rolled with their face against wood slats, they may have survived. And that is actually not an uncommon thing. In the, in the study that we did using the, um, your data, um, when we looked at older babies versus younger babies, the soft bedding was the primary risk in the 4 to 12 month olds. And a major issue was that the babies would roll over or roll off of something into soft bedding and then could, they could not extract themselves and they died. Yeah, and I would also add an observation that uh, is constantly uh, repeated at the Consumer Product Safety Commission is that uh, infants like this are totally involuntary risk takers. You can't educate them not to roll around uh, in the crib. And expecting parents to take precaution when they look at a crib bumper and they just see something that's warm and inviting and beautiful. Uh, and the, the hazard associated with it, at least from my perspective, is not at all obvious. So one of the things that we're more concerned about is dealing with things that could be labeled as hidden, non-obvious hazards. So that sort of adds to the concern that we have. Uh, are there any other observations, comments, questions? Yes, Dr. Shears. Well, I'd like to uh, talk about like multiple causes. When you have a wedging, you have two surfaces. So you could be have the baby uh, between a bumper and a pillow, and you say, well, what's the cause? Well, I don't care if the baby's face is pointed into the bumper or pointed into the pillow. Point is, if you take away one of those uh, surfaces, you don't have the wedging. So if the bumper weren't there, you wouldn't have had the death. 
Thank you all very much. Thank you for uh, driving out uh, long distance this morning and uh, fitting us into a busy schedule. Uh, Ms. Kaus? Mispronounced that. Coles. Okay. You got it right earlier, so I was <laughs> impressed. Well, I'm so glad and, and thank you, Commissioner Adler, for having this session. I think it's brought out a lot of good information. My name is Nancy Coles. I'm the Executive Director of Kids in Danger. We're a nonprofit that's dedicated to protecting children by improving children's product safety. Our mission is to promote the development of safer products, advocate for children, and educate the public about dangerous children's products like the bumpers we're talking about today. Um, we were founded in 1998 by the parents of Danny Kayser, who was killed in a recalled portable crib at his licensed child care home in Chicago. Informing Kid, his parents made it their mission to prevent other families from suffering the same tragedy that they did. I really appreciate all the in-depth information we've heard here today. The staff report presents a skewed view of the danger, one that has been balanced by the statements that we've heard here today to give a fuller picture. The case against permitting padded crib bumpers in a child's sleep environment is clear. This isn't medicine vital to a child's health that may have some side effects that we must weigh and manage. It isn't a product that serves a useful purpose for safety and that proper education on its use is needed. This is an unnecessary accessory to decorate a nursery that has no place in a safe sleep environment. Industry has attempted to paint this as a safety item, but it is not. By talking about the safety benefits of bumper pads, both the manufacturers and the CPSC staff are saying that a crib, one of the most highly regulated of children's products, is unsafe without an aftermarket product being added to it. And that's a very dangerous message to be giving to parents. We say it, kid, we say decorate the nursery, not the crib. Slide right. three. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Uh, in our educational materials and when talking to parents, Kid has always warned against crib bumper pads. Any soft bedding in a crib or bassinet can cause suffocation and have been linked to SIDS. As we've heard, older babies can pull to a stand, can use bumper pads as footings to catapult out of the crib, possibly facing severe injuries from a fall. While most deaths in cribs are caused by suffocation or entrapment, most non-fatal injuries come from falls. When Dr. Thatch published his research in 2007 in the journal Pediatrics, we thought that would put an end to the use of crib bumper pads. He found the 27 deaths over a period of about a decade that were attributable to bumper pads, where babies were found with their face or head against the bumper pad or wedged between the mattress and bumper pad. But unfortunately, crib bedding manufacturers tried to discredit the doctor's research and promoted bumpers as a safe product for cribs. You have heard here today from both N.J. Shears and Dr. Thatch, again, they've updated the data that shows the same outcome. Bumpers have been involved in babies' deaths. Then in early 2010, Kid was approached by two families that renewed our commitment to seeing this product off the market. Slide four, this is Aiden. Aiden suffocated on his crib bumper in Texas. We were contacted almost immediately afterwards by his grandmother. She had purchased the bumper pad herself, led to believe they were part of a safe sleep environment and important to keep her grandson from injuring himself. Imagine her heartache after learning the very thing that she had purchased, thinking it would protect her beloved peanut, as she called him, ended up being what suffocated him as he slept with his mother in the same room because, of course, suffocating babies don't make any noise. On slide five, then we heard from the family of Preston Maxwell. Just eight weeks old, Preston slept on a sleep positioner in the middle of his crib. His distraught parents found him one morning. He had rolled off the sleep positioner and ended up with his face between the bumper pad and mattress. Immediately after Preston's death, the CPSC, along with FDA, led by Dr. Sharfstein, issued a warning against sleep positioners saying they were unnecessary and dangerous. For years, that reduced the number of sleep positioners on the market to almost zero. 
I will say we're beginning to see them creep back in again when we look online, and I would urge CPSC and FDA to stay vigilant against this. But no action was taken by CPSC to eliminate the padded bumper on which Preston suffocated. Among children's product safety issues, as we've heard here today, a safe sleep environment is an overriding concern. Suffocation, most of it in a sleeping environment, is the leading cause of unintentional death of infants. The number of sleep-related deaths in infants is too high, and it's not showing signs of decreasing, except for as we've heard in certain areas. It is a public health emergency. In bassinets, portable cribs, play yards, cribs, or some newly designed product or accessory, sleep products must meet the highest standards for safety. It is the one place we encourage parents to leave a baby alone. Crim bumper pads were developed when crib slats were far apart and there was a risk of a child slipping through, only to be caught by the neck and strangle. It didn't work then. Babies still strangled that way. And the crib standard changed to limit the space between the slats decades ago, as Commissioner Adler pointed out. But the padding remains now as a decorative item that some parents are falsely led to believe will keep their baby safer. Manufacturers point to it keeping babies' arms and legs from getting stuck between the slats. But our review of saferproducts.gov information shows that almost 90% of the reports made of that problem are of babies over the age of six months, when manufacturers themselves recommend the product be removed to avoid a baby stepping on it to climb out of the crib. So manufacturers seem to be saying that if parents don't heed their warnings, they can keep their baby safe, uh, which we think uh, is obviously has bad consequences for all kinds of public safety messages. We must stop the use of crib bumper pads for our vulnerable babies. A bump or a bruise of the leg or even the head is nothing compared to the horror that Preston and Aiden's families face and others like them face. <coughs> Six shows a timeline, which I'm actually, we've talked about a lot of it today. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Uh, obviously, the, the 2007 report, 2010, if you've not seen the report by uh, Alan Gabler on uh, the Chicago Tribune on Preston's death and other deaths. Um, Chicago, proud to say, became the first, at this point, the only jurisdiction to ban all forms of bumpers. Um, AST, ASTM then, in response to that, passed a, a standard um, that limited the, uh, limited it to traditional padded bumpers rather than very puffy ones. Um, and have tried to use that to stop further state action in other places. CPSC accepted JPMA's uh, proposal on the crib bumper pads. Um, Maryland bans the sale of crib bumper pads, and then the, just this year we had the new report again highlighting that the deaths are growing. Manufacturers, well, let me go to the next slide. Um, I'm just trying to think. A, a lot of this has been said. I just want to also point out that based on the AAP recommendations that we've heard this have just been updated this week and the history of suffocation, almost all hospitals in our country tell parents not to use crib bumpers in the crib. Retailers, Target, Ikea, and others have, been, have stopped selling them. Almost all child care facilities are prohibited from using bumpers, and it should be noted that child care regulations in states are often a good place to put best practices into place. We can monitor and regulate what is used in these settings as opposed to in private homes. If it's important for your child's nap at childcare, it should also be important at home. As I mentioned, the ASTM standard simply um, limits bumpers to two inches of thickness, which by the way is even thicker than most bump bumpers currently on the market, so they can start making them fatter, I guess. Uh, simply means that the very type of bumpers that we know have suffocated children will now, would now be labeled as safe if the CPSC adopted that as their own standard. All right, bear is best, slide number eight. In addition to the direct risk of suffocation from crib bumper pads, there's also the issue of contributing to SIDS by reducing airflow in the crib and confusing parents on the safe sleep message that encourages a bear crib. The safe sleep message is a hard one. The messaging is simple and straightforward. Back to sleep, bear is best. Both messages have reduced infant deaths. But bear is best runs smack into our intuition of what we think babies need. 
We even call a mother preparing for her baby as someone who is nesting, surrounding the baby with softness and cuddling them even when we aren't holding them. But that softness and padding is the opposite of how babies sleep safely, which is why the sale of padded bumpers not only increases the risk of babies suffocating on the pad itself, but of following the lead of manufacturers by adding more padding and softness around their baby. It's hard to convince parents to remove padded items such as pillows from the crib when you're selling them a two inch thick pad to wrap around the crib at the same time. Those in child safety and public health arenas work tirelessly to educate parents on the concept of safe sleep and padded bumpers in the marketplace make it all the harder. Commissioner Adler, you already mentioned that a few weeks ago you participated in our workshop that uh, ASTM and ICFASO did on information and education campaigns. We heard about how without changes in design or regulation, education has little effect. Every day, parents are bombarded by pictures like this in the media. These are just took me about a minute to find all of these online. And as new parents consider what they need for their nursery, registering, picking out all the wonderful things they want, these pictures didn't show up as clearly, but they can come across hundreds of these, both in stores, outside of Chicago and Maryland, um, and in uh, online. As long as bumpers are still on store shelves, they will continue to be used despite every health and safety organization warning against their use. You've heard a lot of compelling information here today. I know the debate will continue despite that. But I urge you to m protect our most vulnerable consumers from this unnecessary product. As we said, we thought in 2007 that data would be enough to compel us to stop selling this product. I was wrong then, but I hope that CPSC will take this action now, almost a decade later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I invite any comments now uh, at this point uh, from those who have participated in today's uh, discussion, which I have found extraordinarily enlightening and uh, very educational. So I invite comments. Ms. Covington. I actually um, was at the AAP release the other day, and I, um, I asked the question about mesh bumper pads because we've heard people trying to discuss, trying to present them as a, an alternative without the padding. And I know the AP has some reasoning. Rachel, you sort of touched on it in your paper, but can you expound a little more on what the hazards are with the mesh bumpers? We don't know what the hazards are. Um, you know, there aren't any data on them. Um, and, um, and, but, you know, our reasoning is that um, we don't see any benefit to them either. And so why? put unnecessary stuff in the crib when you don't need them. Um, unless there's compelling evidence that there is benefit, I don't see that why we would want to put them in the crib. Yes, Mention please how, do. how we handled that in Maryland because it was not in our original proposal, but we in the end focused on non-mesh pads for the, and the way we explained that publicly was that we felt like we had evidence of, of meaningful risk to kids from the, um, non-mesh ones. We weren't at all recommending the mesh ones. We said that publicly. We think the best thing was nothing, but the threshold for us to take an action like actually banning the sale was was similar to what you said before, Commissioner Adler, was evidence of harm, and we felt like the evidence of harm was very clear for um, the, the, the non-mesh. Yeah, and that, that indeed is a challenge for CPSC. Uh, I, 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 wasn't it Carl Sagan who said absence of evidence is not uh, evidence of absence? It's one of my favorite expressions, but it, it, it's a very insightful point. I wish that were the case uh, for what regulates what CPSC uh, has the authority to act on and, and doesn't have the authority to act on. And uh, this would be, a, and I'm just speaking for myself, uh, this would be an instance where we would need some kind of evidence, even engineering evidence, uh, if not epidemiological evidence, at least from my perspective, for us to take action. And that's where I'm hopeful that we can get some data that will help resolve the, answer, the question one way, one way or the other. If I could just say on that, too, because we've dealt with this, obviously. We have not passed a ban in Illinois, but we have talked about it. And we also started, similar to Chicago, banning all products because we do believe they're useless. There's no point in having them. Uh, but we did end up 
compromising on that with the caveat, and I would give the same caveat to CPSC, is we need to get that data. We need to um, monitor it closely. If we do see, even if you go a direction, um, you know, where you allow the mesh or something similar um, for whatever reason that you, um, you know, follow that very closely so that you're not unnecessarily putting other children at risk. If, if they uh, used more, would we see additional risk? We just don't know. Dr. Yes, uh, Mr. Adler, I have a comment on uh, mesh bumpers. Thank you, Dr. Thatch. Uh, yeah, our uh, a granddaughter we had kept sticking her legs or arms out through the rails and would yell and cry and scream and got everybody in the house up. <laughs> so, so I thought maybe a mesh mesh bumper would be the uh, be the thing to prevent that. Um, another thing is, you know, mesh bumpers have been on the market for, I guess, I don't know, uh, three or four or five years. And how long are we going to go without any report of incident before we can say that they should not, uh, the, that they are okay to use? Uh, that's a, that's a great question, and that's what the sort of thing that I know AAP is thinking about, and uh, other jurisdictions are thinking about. And that it's a it's a very uh, Im important question. Uh, and I thought you were going to relate an anecdote uh, about your is it your granddaughter? Uh, yeah, granddaughter. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and this I'm sorry, this just triggers one of the things that I was always imp always impressed on me at. Uh, uh, in terms of assessing data, and that is the plural of anecdote is not data, but sometimes a, a number of anecdotes can add up to meaningful data. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Delayed. Uh, other questions or comments? Yeah. I actually had a question for Ms. Coles. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, where uh, bumpers would fit into a 104, given that you have expertise on that issue. Sure I do, um, and I'm actually not sure how many people know that the, the Section 104 that was written um, into the 2008 law was actually initially drafted uh, between Jan Chikowski and myself when I first started working at KID back in 2001. Um, as you know, as I mentioned, Danny was killed in a portable crib in uh, child care. Uh, his parents were shocked, as most parents would be, to find that there was no requirements for testing for safety for children's products before they were put on the market. For that particular product, there wasn't even a voluntary standard at the time. Um, and really felt, as you, we've said here today, that's not what parents think. Parents think if it's on the store shelf, it's safe. Someone's made sure it's safe. Um, and so we drafted those 104 rules to put in place third-party testing and mandatory standards for those products, not just relying on the industry. Um, as it's developed, uh, that initial list that was in the 104 were uh, products for which there were ASTM standards at the time. Um, and so when it was adopted, uh, CPSC rightly added other products to that that also posed similar risks and had the same expectation of parents. And we think that crib bumpers, like many other products that we've added to that, fit right in there. It is a product that's being used. We obviously would prefer a straight ban. I think that that's the... The, the cleanest thing to do, but if we can write a standard such as we've done with bath seats that has, we wrote a very strong standard and no one can make them and so they're effectively banned even though it was an official ban, um, I think it would fit very well within the, within the 104. Can I just follow up and ask, do you have any concerns um, or how would you address, address concerns about whether a bumper fits within the definition of a durable infant product? It's really not that different from other products that are already there. So we have slings, which minus the padding, some of them, most of them are just a piece of material. Um, <clears throat> and we also have things like the Nap Nanny that was recalled, but replacement products for that that are padding covered with material that are used to provide an inclined sleep surface for a child, same materials as the bumper, so I don't see why they wouldn't fit in. And of course, I, uh, those of you who watched the commission discussion uh, addressing crib bumpers uh, about a week ago, uh, I did have an anecdote to relate, and I still remember it vividly, uh, looking out the window of our apartment and seeing my wife's parents drive up with a trailer that had in the trailer a crib that was 
many, many years old and had very wide slats, and the bumpers. And so over my strong <laughs> objections, uh, we put our child in the uh, crib with the bumpers, uh, but I was just thinking those things must have been 25 or 30 years old, and they were handed down from generation to generation. Uh, it's pretty hard to look at those and say they're not durable over time, and it's impossible to look at them and say they're not infant products. For me, the toughest question is how do you draw a line between the products that are clearly infant products that last for generations, which I would include as sheets and blankets and pillows. I'm not, for the moment, suggesting the Commission is going to write standards on Section 104, but uh, the easier question is, at least for me speaking only for myself, uh, that they they are durable infant products. Uh, it's, it's a process of excluding others that, um, from a certain perspective, would fit in the same category. Uh, Dr. Sharfstein. I have a question for Nancy. In the cough and cold medicine, one of the things that was really striking was how much parents thought they were doing the right thing for health for their kids. And a lot of the advertising around those products was, you know, so you can sleep too, everyone needs a good night's sleep. It was very much, you know, and part of the, the unfolding of that issue was people coming to realize that it actually wasn't something they were doing to help their kids. And I just wonder, in, as you have worked on this issue, is your perspective that parents see, are they, do parents see these as purely decorative or are they assuming they're doing something or are some of them assuming they're doing something uh, healthy for their children? Yeah, I think it's it's a mix. I think most most people, I mean, there's, if they're on the store shelves, I mean, you picture how new parents buy things, right? It's not how, oh, I need this, I'm going to go to the store and get it. It's like, I have no idea what I need. I'm going to go to the store, whatever's on the shelf, I'm going to put on my register, I'm going to think that I need it. So they, they think that there's a need for it. They definitely buy it for decoration, but I think they're sometimes led to believe, as we've heard today, that there's safety benefits to it, um, and yet there clearly aren't. In, in the other question from FDA, World of FDA is that, um, for example, on dietary supplements, people generally overstate what they think the level of regulation is for something that if it were really so harmful or you really had this potential, how would it be on the market? Do you have a sense that there's an assumption about that with I, parents? I know there is. I mean, I know parents I talk to and Linda and I often re relay the story. We'd say to people, you know, there's no requirements products be tested for safety and they would base, oh no, that can't possibly be true. Um, they just don't believe it because you know, we feel like we're so overregulated, and yet these things are are not regulated. Even today, the products that fall outside of the Section 104 rules, you can still someone can you know they're up late at night with a baby, and this is where we see the the worst products is around sleep because you really do just want to get some sleep. So they're willing to try all kinds of things. And someone had a good idea, worked for their kid. That's how the nap nanny came about, and now six children have died, five of them on bumper pads. Uh, involving the sleep, the nap nanny, um, and you know, people just they bought it, assuming it must be tested to be safe. Commissioner Adler, this is. Uh, um, I just wanted to add a couple of points to some of the discussions uh, today. Um, I, I would echo what Nancy said with regards to Section uh, One. This is Ami Gadia for the uh, people who are listening to My the apologies. discussion. Um, I, I would echo Nancy's point about Section One Hundred Four. Um, being the right place for um, for commission action or, or the ability to address it through 104. Um, you know, we still think that the ban is, is the way to go, but um, it, products are going to come up over time, right? And they're going to continue to grow. The market's going to continue to innovate. Um, but if the CPSC is to be a nimble agency and the statute's to be um, a living statute that protects consumers against the real risks out there, then it has to be envisioned as, as growing with um, reality. Um, and to, you know, your example of your in-laws coming up, uh, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Adler, with um, the crib from your wife's days as a child um, with the bumpers on it, and, and even Dr. Thatch's um, mention of uh, the example with mesh 
uh, liners, you know, I think that goes to Dr. Sharpstein's point earlier, that, you know, you're going to have a lot of individuals that are having safe experiences with certain products, but given the tremendous risk that does exist and the lack of benefit, it, it lays clear the need for standard. Are there any other comments, uh, Dr. Moon? I just wanted to say everybody thinks that what they're doing is safe until something bad happens and then that whatever was safe is all of a sudden a risk factor. Ms. Covington. I, I, just, uh, I would also um, just urge some caution in looking um, at older data and trying to compare it with current data in terms of what we're finding from investigations that are done in the field by examiner, I mean, in death investigators, because I, I just think it's important to remember that death investigations are getting increasingly better. Um, there's, people are starting to, across the country, use the CDC's infant death investigation tools. They're starting to do dowry and it's more and more. We, we train on it. We get requests from states all the time. And I think as time goes on, we're going to see more of these, actually, because we're doing better investigations. I, I was surprised when we had seven just um, since, you know, probably in a year. So without trying to pin you down and make it into a statistically representative sample, is it your impression that with um, more scrutiny and more uh, examination that we're finding that some of the things that previously we might not have attributed to crib bumpers we now do? Oh, yeah. I mean, when I first started this work, those a lot of those would have just been called SIDS without any discussion. I mean, uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, I sat at many, many, many a child death review team where um, a, a policeman or a death investigator was on their way to a scene and they were called back because they were told the baby had died in their sleep and it was SIDS and they, they didn't even go to the scene. And that practice has really, really shifted. Um, any last comments from anyone here? Uh, we can't thank you enough for uh, leaving your busy lives and coming here to share this information. As I say, I'm just one commissioner, but I promise you that I will take the recording of today's remarks and the data that you've submitted and make sure that it's made part of the record for the uh, impending Section 104 rulemaking that the Commission voted on a week ago. But uh, this, is, this is just an incredibly valuable uh, point of input for the Commission, and I think it'll help round out the record before us. So uh, with that, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, uh, well, thank you all. And uh, with that, uh, we will call this meeting to a close. And again, we thank you. Thank you.